Greetings. My name is Brandon Wolf, and I serve as the Assistant Vice President of Campus and Community Engagement in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. On behalf of our office, I would like to welcome you to today's Cultural Lens Film and Speaker Series. The Cultural Lens Film and Speaker Series is an initiative that introduces cinema, scholars, authors, artists, and activists to campus to address various diversity, equity, and inclusion topics as it relates to our communities. Specifically, we seek to unpack these topics through the power of storytelling in an attempt to drive dialogue around representation, context, and social issues. Our goal is to encourage participants to become critical cultural consumers by creating a space that allows for the exploration, deconstruction, questioning, and conceptualization of issues, its intersections, and implications upon our communities. Today, I am proud to welcome UAB's very own Dr. Andy Baer to discuss his most recent book, Beyond the Usual Beating, the John Burge Police Torture Scandal and Social Movements for Police Accountability in Chicago. As I'm getting ready to um, talk about this, I do want to remind you all, if anybody has accommodations, you can click the closed captioning um, button on up underneath the, uh, like beneath the video, you should see it. Um, so without further ado, let's start. Recently, there has been increased attention, attention to police brutality, accountability, and reform across the United States due to a series of what many have called racially motivated killings. Between Andy and myself, we probably could ramble off at a list of at least 10 of the 164 plus black and brown citizens killed by police in the US from this year alone. However, a topic that seems to go ignored is police torture. Dr. Bear's research and latest book probes this topic in the space of Chicago, Illinois. There's a lot to cover in this book, so I've decided to break the discussion into three major parts. First, the influences which have led to the creation of police torture and coercion. Two, the sustainment of abusive police culture through its romantic depiction. And last, the legacy and aftermath of the John Burge torture scandal itself. So as we continue this discussion, please feel free to chime in with any questions that you may, ha may have. So Dr. Bear, thank you so much for joining us. I'm gonna start off with my first question is, tell me about the title, Beyond the Usual Beating. Why this title and for the audience, who is John Burge? Okay, thank you. First of all, Brandon, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hope you don't mind me calling you Brandon, and I hope you can call me oh, Andy. Boy. I like to think of you as a friend, so go, go ahead and call me Andy instead of Dr. Bear. So I'm really <laughs> flattered to be here. It's a great honor to talk about my book with you and with everyone here in attendance, and um, I particularly appreciate that you took the effort to read the book as closely as you did. You know, we've talked a few times, and I can tell that you really gave it a, a deep, engaged reading, so I appreciate that. Um, so first, just I think everyone who's here should get, hear my very quick sort of elevator speech about who John Burge was and what the John Burge police torture scandal was, because uh, I find that it's, it's relatively unknown, um, both in Chicago and nationally. And there are a lot of uh, kind of news junkies and, and people who follow social justice movements in Chicagoland that are very familiar with John Burge. He's been making headlines. Uh, this scandal has been making headlines for over 30 years. But yeah, I also regularly found people even in, in the city itself that were, un, that were unfamiliar with this. Uh, scandal. Uh, although it, it, I, even today I saw uh, a story in the Chicago uh, press uh, related to John Burge. So in the quick part, the quick way I can describe this is John Burge was a white police detective on the south side of Chicago. Uh, he was born in 1947 in the city of Chicago. So he goes to, he, he grows up on the southeast side of the city in these all white communities. Um, in, in the 1950s when he's a child, there was a series of housing riots, which is essentially white families attacking uh, black pioneers that are moving into public housing within a mile and a half of John Burge's childhood home. So he, as a child, he experiences the uh, collective violence of white resistance to desegregation of housing in the southeast side of Chicago. Then, of course, he goes to public schools that are overwhelmingly white, but are also going through a series of desegregation schemes. Uh, there's a great deal of white resistance in his high school, for example, in the early 1960s. They're trying to keep black students out. John Burge graduates high school in 1965. He goes on to Vietnam. He serves as a military policeman uh, in the south part of the Mekong Delta uh, in a base uh, in South Vietnam that is notorious for allegations of, uh, of torture and abuse of prisoners of war during the Vietnam conflict. 
He's there in 1968, 1969. He comes back to Chicago. His goal the whole time was to become a police officer. So now here he is. He's, let's see, it puts him at about uh, just over 22 years old in 1970. And he becomes a police officer. And within uh, a year and a half, he's a detective. He rises through the ranks very quickly. Now he's a police detective policing the communities that he used to live in. But now there's been great demographic change in those neighborhoods. Now these neighborhoods that were once overwhelmingly 95 plus percent white. Now these neighborhoods are transitioning to ultimately by 1980, upwards of 95, 96, 97 percent African-American. So he's now moved out of these neighborhoods. He's policing his former communities that are now uh, overwhelmingly African-American in population. Crime rates have skyrocketed in the south side of Chicago in the 1970s like they did uh, in major cities across the United States. And as a detective, very early, even when he's in his early 20s, Burge starts to implement a series of coercion techniques. So techniques of uh, what we used to call the third degree. This is police torture. This is a way to coerce confessions from people, particularly in serious felony cases like murders, arsons, sexual assaults, things of that nature. Uh, and this is nothing new to uh, the Chicago police. These tactics have been around for generations. John Burge is pushing them into a new era of professionalized policing in the 1970s. And from 1972 to 1991, Burge oversees the coerced confessions of at least 120 known criminal suspects. Virtually all of them are African American. Uh, this is, Burge is a commander of detectives at this point. He rises quickly, but now he's overseeing dozens of detectives that work underneath him most of which are white, almost all of them are white, but we do have some examples of black detectives participating in coercing confessions. And what they're doing, of course, this is against the law, it's against all kinds of human rights treaties. And when I say torture, uh, I can mean the kind of mundane, the kind of uh, uh, forced stress positions or withholding people from lawyers or from access to a phone, intimidation and threats, the kinds of things we became more familiar with in the early 2000s in the context of a global war on terror. These types of torture tactics were happening in police interrogation rooms in Chicago and elsewhere in the 70s. But in addition to this slaps and kicks and threaten, uh, you know, threatening, uh, uh, intimidating tactics, the detectives also utilized electroshock torture, a technique that was brought to the south side of Chicago from the south side, or excuse me, from South Vietnam, Southeast Asia. And this included rigging up military style field telephones, these little uh, electronic boxes you could turn a crank and it would send electric shock through a series of cords that you could attach to people's ears or their noses or to their genitals. And these people were shocked until they gave incriminating statements, uh, typically just straight up confessions to very serious crimes. Um, but of course, the electroshock was not the only way that these detectives coerced confessions. They also suffocated people with uh, plastic bags, particularly typewriter covers. They uh, played Russian roulette, meaning placing a, a gun into someone's mouth or to someone's head. Uh, and, and often the gun would be unloaded, but they would tell the suspect that there's a bullet in the chamber to terrify them until they start to give incriminating statements. Uh, and this happened throughout the 70s and 80s. And then in the early 1990s, uh, there was a series of, of civil litigations. Police torture survivors sue John Burge in the city of Chicago. And there's a, a series of court cases in the federal, uh, federal courts uh, where John Burge is accused of torture, and we get torture survivors testifying under oath. We're getting suddenly the discovery of all kinds of corroborating evidence, including photographs of abuse, excuse me, photographs of, of wounds and injuries that uh, these torture survivors had on their body, including uh, abrasion burns and electric shock spark burns on their ears. Um, and so the early 1990s, it, it attracts the attention of a social movement in the city that has been around for decades at this point, um, and the social movement Le leaps into action to get Burge fired, uh, to locate survivors and get them released from prison if they were coerced into giving false testimony. Um, and so throughout the 1990s and 2000s, there's an ongoing, I think, it, honestly, the, the, the social movement around the Burge cases continues even in 2020, because although Burge has passed away in 2018, uh, there are still at least a couple dozen uh, African-American prisoners in state prisons and federal prisons in Illinois and elsewhere who allege that they were sent to prison because of coerced confessions through torture. Um, and so the social movement goes uh, on for, for decades and counting. The social movement accomplishes a great deal, including getting birds fired, uh, compiling a list of torture survivors, winning civil uh, suits and, and civil settlements from the city of Chicago. Um, we get many uh, torture survivors released and exonerated we get uh, a moratorium on the death penalty because Burge sent at least 12, really, I, I think up, uh, upwards of almost 20 men that were tortured under Burge in his 
detectives wound up on death row. And they also organized a social movement. They called themselves the Death Row 10. And some of those people were released. Uh, there was a crisis in Illinois in the late 90s uh, around the death penalty issue. We get a moratorium on the death penalty. We get a governor commuting all of the sentences of every single man and woman on death row on the day before he leaves office uh, uh, in 2002, a Republican governor who had previously helped reinstate the death penalty in Chicago and Illinois uh, in the late 1970s. So he clears all of death row. He pardons four bird survivors outright. He leaves office. He, he himself winds up in prison, the governor. Lots of governors of Illinois wound up in prison the last 20 years. Uh, in addition to that, we get this appointment of a special prosecutor. We get appointment of all kinds of official bodies to investigate the torture cases. Eventually, John Burge is uh, arrested and indicted for perjury and obstruction of justice. Uh, he, goes, he gets convicted in 2011. He serves part of a four and a half year sentence. He doesn't serve the whole sentence. Uh, and, and this all really culminates in the book, in the, in the epilogue with the passage in 2015, uh, in the Chicago City Council of a reparations ordinance. They actually use the language of reparations. We can talk in more detail what that's all about, but this is, uh, I think, a, a massive and symbolic and concrete victory for the social movement in Chicago that hopefully will be replicated in other cities, uh, in, in other scandals related to police violence. And so we kind of end in 2015 with the reparations ordinance, but we see that this the struggle for justice in the Burge cases continues. So that's probably more than I meant to say. Once I get started, I can't stop. I mean, I'll give a quick answer just what's with the title. The title is Beyond the Usual Beating, and I'm drawing from an internal police memo from 1990 when um, there was a quasi-civilian review organization called the Office of Professional Standards in Chicago. And it was not at all a civilian review. It was, it was staffed by civilians, but it was inside the office of the police superintendent. I mean, so this was a kind of a whitewashing organization where citizens could file complaints uh, that often went nowhere, often they were lost, uh, in, or the OPS would, uh, <laughs> this office would recommend punishments, but they would never happen. Um, but when they went to investigate Burge, they corroborated the allegations of shock, electric shock torture. And in the mm -hmm. official report that was released, and then at, lawyers and activists had to fight for years to actually get this report released to the public. Uh, but the report said that the abuse in this po particular police station, it was called Area 2 headquarters on the south side of Chicago. They said the abuse at Area 2 went beyond the usual beating and went into such esoteric areas as uh, electroshock torture, torture and, and, and other psychological techniques. And they said that police supervisors and command staff at Area 2 knew about it and allowed it to happen. Um, and, th and this document has served as kind of a smoking gun evidence that the city of Chicago was aware that torture was happening and John Burge was still on the force, right? He's, when that memo was released in 1990, John Burge, you know, he wasn't like, he wasn't suspended from the police department until social movement activists forced the hand of the police in November of 1991. So he continues to shock people even though, and torture people, even though the department itself has concluded that the torture allegations um, are legitimate. Um, and so I, I borrow that language from that document because I found it so stunning that the police department would acknowledge so flippantly that there is something out there that we might call the usual beating. And the only reason why Burge stood out and attracted so much attention and became this massive scandal that's cost the city hundreds of millions of dollars and counting is because Burge just walked up to that line of where the police staff, where journalists and academics and, and uh, uh, politicians and just the general public in Chicago seem to expect a certain degree of punishment being meted out by police officers and detectives particularly in custodial abuse and interrogation rooms. There's this idea that, well, when you get arrested by the Chicago police, you're gonna expect a little bit of a beating. The only thing that happened that was so egregious was that Burrs went a little too far, went beyond the usual beating, went into those areas of electroshock that kind of, that, um, you know, to use a pun, I can't think of another word, it shocked the city and shocked the nation and drew international mm -hmm. headlines. Uh, if, if John Burge and his men had not used the shock box, perhaps the, more mundane and, and ordinary types of coerced confessions would have gone on unchecked. And if we look closely at what was happening in police interrogation rooms throughout the 70s and 80s, and I will say it's hard to look closely at what happens in interrogation rooms because those are secret places. Mm -hmm. When we look closely at what was happening, we see that a lot of police officers then, and I would argue now, are still using unethical and perhaps illegal methods to coerce incriminating statements in felony cases. Most of those cases wind up in plea deals and, and are never, you know, never see the light of a, of a courtroom. Um, and so there's that whole usual beating 
The Coors Confessions of the nature that Burge helped shed light on because he went a little too far and attracted far more attention than detectives usually like to see. Thank you so much. Like, I, like you're, you're basically saying what I, I hope to communicate. Like, there's so much information in this book. Like, I, I highly recommend that you get it. So I'm going to back this up a little bit. I want to talk about, like, the cultural influences that led to this, this culture of police abuse. When you opened up your book, you spoke is exactly to how the earlier life of John Burge and, and the personal and personal bigotry and structural racism kind of started facilitating this racist police violence in Chicago. As I was looking into this, I noticed the social milieu was much more complex with these community layers, right? So you have, in the 70s, you had the backdrop of the, uh, the Southeast Chicago residents, they start, you know, um, these these things that are happening beyond the, the uh, beyond the beyond the control of these Southeast Chicago residents. So you have the post-war distant industrialization and factory job loss. You had neighborhood investment. You of course you know, you mentioned already the growth of black and brown middle class transitioning into these historically white neighborhoods, and as well as the rise of crime. So out of this, right? You get this figure. You get John Burns, and you get this whole rhetoric of being tough on crime to protect these white communities. And as I read this, I started thinking to myself, this sounds a lot like the rhetoric that we hear today. So I want to ask you, how does the context of social environment and, and these larger social influences shape the rhetoric we hear today that justifies um, and justifies us being okay with this being tough on crime approach that leads to police abuse? Yeah, great question. There's many ways I could go with this, I think. Uh, there's a trick here in writing about police violence in the past is that on one hand, I want to make claims that John Burge and the John Burge police torture scandal is, is aberrational in some fashion. It's particularly sensational. It, it serves as a great narrative skeleton on which I can uh, tell a, a historical narrative that hopefully compels a reader. But also I can then place all these other uh, interpretations and historical analysis onto this one narrative. And so I wanna highlight the ways that Burge and the Burge scandal are unique to Chicago in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But on this other hand, police violence is timeless. The, 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 what Burge and his men were doing in most cases was quite characteristic and representative of policing. In other words, it wasn't aberrational. But as an historian, we focus so much on context. And we want to make sure that we understand, we place the Burge scandal and Burge himself and all the other detectives that he worked with, we place them in their proper, as you said, a social milieu or a historical context and social milieu. We can understand uh, the first part of the first chapter or two of my book is, in, in a sense, kind of telling a story of the making of a torture, right? Understanding Chicago, post World War II Chicago, the 1970s, or sorry, beginning in the late 40s into the 50s and 60s and 70s, and understanding how does this man who's born, you know, is a baby boomer, he's born in 1947, he experiences so many elements of Chicago, white Chicago life in that, uh, in that short lifespan that helps us explain the decisions that he makes to use torture against black suspects on the south side of Chicago in the 1970s in this particular fashion using electroshock. So I try to portray the setting and to make sure that the reader understands that John Burge, while um, a racist man, while a, a man that is immoral that we look at as a somewhat of a villain, but when we write history, we try to avoid this kind of good versus evil, heroes and villains. I want to complicate John Burge, while I also use his life and career to condemn himself. You know, obviously my sympathies are with the torture survivors and the activists. But I do go to some lengths at the beginning of the book to let us understand that Burge was a human, right? His, his personality, his decisions, his life, his career was shaped by the events that unfolded around him and that he participated in. Uh, but that's a tricky thing because I also don't want to appear to be some sort of apologist to try to explain, um, mm -hmm. you know, but Burge in a way other than I just want to provide... Um, multiple perspectives of what happened while ultimately concluding that torture's wrong, the torture scandal was egregious uh, and, and tragic. Um, and so when we get to the 1970s, when Burge is actually now a detective and he's coercing confessions, we can map Burge's career, right, in the police department, 1970 to 1991 or so when he gets suspended, he's fired in 1993. Uh, so his police career maps very well onto a, a map a chronological map of rising violent crime in Chicago. If we were to look at the city of Chicago and look at violent crime rates, the heights of, of, of annual murders in Chicago and other FBI index crimes that are 
reliable, though some crime statistics are not reliable, but homicide and murder statistics are fairly reliable. We see that about the early 1970s to the early 1990s is the peak moment of crime in the city of Chicago's entire history. So Burgess, in other words, his career unfolds during a serious crime crisis that is impacting particularly black communities and poor communities in Chicago. And Burgess is now um, making a career off of trying to solve serious murders and to close cases and to get a high clearance rate so we can get promoted, so we can win commendations, so he can rise through the ranks. And there's a lot of work for him to do because it's a very violent and dangerous time in the city's history. Uh, but like uh, it, alongside the crime crisis in Chicago, we also see a political opportunism in American politics at this period. It's most uh, famously and, and um, visibly and vocally evoked by President Richard Nixon, who runs, you know, for the, uh, as a Republican candidate for the presidency in 1968. He's inaugurated in 1969. He runs on a law and order platform that borrows from previous conservative campaigns of George Wallace and Barry Goldwater in 1964. And so law and order politics become to dominate in a very bipartisan fashion by the 1970s. Many Democrats, even liberal people, liberal, uh, liberal political candidates are finding that they must appear tough on crime in order to win elections, to stave off challengers. And big city mayors, like the mayors of Chicago, the mayors of New York and Los Angeles, while this has appeared, we're actually getting a lot of first African-American mayors in these cities. They're also having to appear to be tough on crime, right? That's, that's the winning political ticket, right? Mm -hmm. Law and order, uh, tough on crime. And so obviously Burgess' career also maps well onto the history, the chronology of the rise of mass incarceration from the early 70s, and particularly in a major way in the 1980s on massive wars on crime, wars on drugs, wars on gangs. And that mm -hmm. happens across the spectrum. That's not a Republican conservative phenomenon. The war on drugs, the war on crime happens no matter who is in office, more or less, with some exceptions, but it's a bipartisan effort, as we're familiar with by the horrible record that presidential candidate Joe Biden has on these issues, right, as a, as a, as a champion of law and order from the Democratic left in the 80s and 90s. And in the city of Chicago, you get Democratic mayors like Richard Daley, both the first Daley, his son, Richard M. Daley, and even an African-American pioneer uh, the great Harold Washington, who was the first black mayor of Chicago, and he was in office in the 1983 until 1987. Um, and we see that the political backdrop of law and order tends to trigger more tolerance for police abuse amongst everyday citizens. And so to finish, you know, to get to your final part of that question was, should we be alarmed by the return of law and order rhetoric, particularly in the 2016 presidential campaign of Donald Trump and continued throughout his administration and then particularly now in 2020, where we see President Trump echoing uh, the law and order rhetoric of 1960s segregationists, 1970s and 80s crime warriors. And although the crime rates in America are drastically reduced in 2020 from what they once were, right? Now, the, cr the violent crime rates in virtually every American city, including Chicago, is about half what it was in the early 1990s. Now, Chicago has had a recent uptick. It's still nowhere near the levels of violent crime rates that we saw in the 1970s uh, and, and, or, and even into the 1990s. And so we're seeing an odd kind of juxtaposition of a time of relative low crime. Right? We have the lowest crime rates in America that we've seen since the early 1960s, yet we're seeing a political opportunist savvy demand for law and order you know, crackdowns on crime that seems to me just kind of a crass effort to exploit uh, particularly white racial fears uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an odd and strange and very sensational year. Um, and so I would be alarmed, and I am, and I would think other people should be too, that when we see uh, law, and order pol uh, law and order politics rise to the fore, we should expect a growing tolerance among the population for police, uh, uh, police violence, because when we feel that we're fighting a war on crime, sometimes we feel like we have to uh, you know, win at all costs. The ends justify the means. We gotta take the handcuffs off the police. We gotta stop coddling criminals. And so that means perhaps that along the way, there's gonna be some violations of civil liberties. But on the flip side of that, what makes me optimistic is that we have a far more robust uh, social movement tradition in 2020 that was just in its infancy uh, in the 1970s. And so there are plenty of activists uh, who, veteran activists of all ages that today um, are very familiar with what the law and order playbook looks like and are adept at countering that. And I think that 
I don't think we're going to see a repeat of, of the police excesses of the 1980s and 1990s, but only because social movement activists are being vigilant. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you brought this point up, right, about the activists, because also in the background, we have the civil unrest that's been detailed during this time period from the Kerner Commission report about the uprisings that was taking place in over 100 cities following the assassination, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Then you had that followed by the responding, the response to the assassination of other black leaders at the hands of law enforcement. Um, one of them that you brought up particularly was uh, Fred Hampton in the book. So how do you think these events shaped uh, community police relations in the midst of the um, rise in violence? Because you did show that also in the book, it was that while you had on one hand the torture and the crackdown by police officers, you also had the community responding. They were almost like fighting the police as well for kidnapping police officers, um, shooting at police officers, um, and just you know not pushing back against their arrival in the neighborhoods. Well, if I understand your question correctly, we want to see kind of what impact did um, one the civil unrest of the 1960s have on police community relations. Um, and then also what impact did sensational acts of police violence have on the way local communities, particularly black urban communities, how they experienced policing, how they reacted. I think Absolutely. I would say that the urban uprisings, civil disorders, uh, the rebellions in the 1960s, white conservative observers often called these urban riots. And I think some of most Americans of a certain age that may have lived through the 1960s, they hear, they know that they refer to these as the riots, the 60s riots. So we got Watts in 1965, of course, Detroit and Newark in 1967, and the, as Brandon mentioned, the dozens of urban rebellions that erupted after the assassination of Martin Luther King. So every year after 1964, we get these uh, long, hot summers of civil unrest that looks similar to what we see uh, in 2020, although mm -hmm. these were far, actually far more destructive and there was a much greater loss of life in the 1960s, primarily because the police shot and killed so many people, particularly black people during these rebellions. And um, there's a variety of reasons why I think we're not, we didn't see police shooting and killing dozens of people during the disorders in 2020, when we did see that in the 60s. And I, just to be quick, I would think that cell phone cameras have a lot to do with that. And also yeah. four, four or five decades of kind of police public relations, uh, recognizing that they can't just open fire on people marching through the streets, although they did, uh, but not to the same scales in the 60s. So I think we, we gotta look at sort of a feedback loop, kind of this complex cause and effect. Police violence triggered those civil disorders in the 1960s. Virtually every one of those civil disorders was triggered by some act of just mundane, ordinary police violence that had somehow uh, was received by the community that witnessed it as just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Right, so the Watts uprising in 1965 happens after kind of a routine traffic stop gone wrong, where white police officers begin to abuse uh, two black men and their mother during a traffic stop. And passersby and observers watch this, and they attack the police, and it turns into this uh, several day long rebellion with you know billions of dollars of property damage and, and the cops killing dozens of people. Um, and that's going to be repeated throughout the 60s. So what's happening in the 60s is a a burst of rebellion that is pent up anger stemming from decades and decades of police abuse and racial discrimination uh, and uh, housing and educational segregation in the North, this idea that um, African-Americans who had left the South and moved to the cities of the North and the West Coast, expecting to find some opportunities, a so-called promised land, instead faced a great deal of white racial hatred and violence in places like Oakland and Los Angeles and Chicago and Cleveland and Pittsburgh and New York and everywhere in between. And so, there have this decades of pent up anger and frustration with police violence contributes to these urban rebellions. And then how the, the police then respond in kind, right? They double down on their repressive authoritarian uh, style of policing. They beg for and demand um, calls for law and order. They get federal grants to fight wars on crime. They arm themselves to the teeth. They are preparing for the next rebellion that often just never comes, right? We're not gonna see another riot uh, or rebellion in Detroit after 1967, at least if not nowhere near of that nature. But of course, the, the Detroit Police Department's ready, right? They're, gear, they're ready to go after 1967. They're gonna get the armored vehicles, the semi-automatic and automatic weapons. They're gonna get you know, body armor, and, they're gonna, and this is just gonna go on and on for decades and decades, because they're all being prepared, or they're all preparing to fight the next rebellion. In some cases, it does come. I mean, LA has a repeat 
rebellion in 1992, similar to the Watts, but unique in its own way as well. And so now you get more, even more repressive policing. So let me make this clear. Repressive policing caused rebellions, and the solution is more repression. And so, it's not, it's, so it makes sense that we would see in the 1970s and 1980s and 90s and all the way through today that police community relations only deteriorated. If you're familiar with the Kerner Commission report that Brandon mentioned earlier, you know, this blue ribbon panel uh, that published a report in 1968 that's actually in stunning ways is, is, is quite a progressive document in its prescription of, of solutions and its diagnosis of the problem that says these urban rebellions are being caused by white racism and by systemic violence by policing and by the state. And, but the Corner Commission is read and it makes, becomes a bestseller on the New York Times list, uh, but the, the policy recommendations are not implemented. Instead, we get law and order, we get war on crime, war on drugs. And so the problems that existed in the 1960s that led to urban rebellion are only exacerbated. Uh, the, the, the conditions are made even worse. And then on top of that, we get decades of deindustrialization. We get neoliberal policies by Republican and Democratic policymakers, including slashing taxes, budget crises in cities. We get privatization and union busting. Um, we get privatization of all kinds of city services. And so by the 1980s, 1990s, we have uh, desperately poor conditions of concentrated poverty in these cities and the solution to poverty and, and uh, crime and misery is that solutions that we have come up with have been just more policing, more prosecutors, more prisons. And so police community relations, of course, have gotten only worse since the 1960s. And I think we're really reaping the benefits of in 2020 with this massive nationwide uprising of the likes of which we didn't even see in the 1960s, that this is a product of decades and decades of, of false, symbolic, bad faith police reform. It's a, de it's a, it's a, we're reaping the, the costs of um, decades of neoliberal policies of disinvestment in cities. Um, and so community relations are, you know, I don't know if I could argue that they're at an all time low, but you know, let you be the judge. So um, I, I want to kind of hit one of the questions that we just received in the chat. Um, so one of the cute questions that was asked is, um, are we seeing an increase in police violence or is it just that we have smartphones now that allow us to see what has always been going on? That's a great question. I, I would, it, it's difficult, first of all, to answer that with any authority because we don't have a lot of data either in the present day and particularly historically we don't have a lot of quantitative data about police violence. It's very difficult to know how many people do the police intimidate, threaten in the course of a year in any given city? How many people do the police beat or assault? There's a myriad of reasons why we don't have that data. And mm -hmm. I would just begin by saying the police don't keep that data and they don't want you to have that data, mm -hmm. right? And so, and partly because police unions have had such a, police unions have risen to so much strength and power that they're trying to protect their, uh, their officers so that they're kind of, citizen complaints of a particular officer, data on police violence or abuse of power just will not be uh, collected. And will, if it is collected, it won't be disseminated. So we don't really have the numbers. Even a police shootings. Now, in the last 10 years, in, you know, because of the rise of a Black Lives Matter movement, I don't know when we would trace the, the, the beginnings of this shift. I mean, it's obviously the, the killing of Trayvon Martin in 2012. And more importantly, uh, at least important for the, the, what, the, the chronology of the movement, it's the, it's the acquittal of, of George Zimmerman in 2013 that has led to a great deal of energy and movement around these issues. So now private citizens and journalists and activists are collecting data on police shootings. And some police departments are, but it's scattered. Uh, it's, they're not trustworthy. And so one, we don't have the data to answer that, but I still wanna try to answer your question. And from my understanding of policing in the 20th century, I'm fairly confident to venture the idea that police violence is, lo is lesser. We see there's a fewer uh, episodes of police violence in 2020 than there were in 1980 and then there were in 1950. Uh, now, again, it's hard to quantitate that or prove that, um, but, the, but if we really scour even journalistic accounts of everyday interactions with citizens and police in circa 1960, um, we're gonna see a lot of stuff that's familiar to us today, certainly, but uh, we're gonna see, um, even more egregious acts of everyday police violence. I mean, it's even up to the inclusive, including, uh, you know, torture and interrogation rooms, which I argue would still happens today. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a variety of reasons why police violence has diminished by 2020. But your point is apt is what we're seeing though, 
as it were, documenting and recording it, and we're paying closer attention. And also, we're living through a period where social movement activists had kind of uh, and and had prepped the, this population to be on high alert. So and to to be uh, activists have helped frame police violence and helped counter decades of police justification. So no longer are we so trusting of the police narrative in the wake of, a, of, of, a, of an act of violence. No longer are we as w willing as Americans to say, well, if someone robbed a bank or shot at a cop, then they deserve what they got. I think we're, there's been a long kind of effort to, to challenge that idea that if you commit a crime, then, you, then you're, you, you've waived your rights, you've waived your liberties. And then of course, I, I think I'm, you know, beating around the obvious. I mean, you're right. I think it's the proliferation of cell phones and cell phone cameras and social media. When someone, when a police officer attacks or kills, murders someone in the streets, it's likely now that they're going to they're going to be filmed doing it, and they might even have it on a body camera, or a dash cam, dash cam video. Uh, and as uh, police are are suppressing those videos, they don't want those videos getting out, but they do from time to time. And of course, we all have our own cameras. Um, and so not only are they being recorded, but then you can just share it on social media and it goes viral across the country, across the world. And, you know, when the police, for example, assassinated Fred Hampton in December 1969, and there's no footage of that. Uh, but they, the police were sloppy and lazy and they left a great deal of evidence. They just left the apartment open. You could see the place where they shot and killed Fred Hampton. So there was evidence, um, but we didn't watch it on video. And then Fred Hampton is probably a bad example because very few people doubted what happened in that case. But there are plenty of other high profile moments in uh, American police history uh, where it just becomes kind of the word of the police uh, and that's it because the, the, the person who was the victim of police violence is, is dead and buried. Um, and, and we can see the power of videotape even by looking at something like the Rodney King video in, you know, in mm -hmm. 1991. So yeah, I, I think that police violence is likely down, but it's far more visible than it once was. So one of the things that struck me about this book is that we're seeing, especially during the 70s and, and part of the 80s, is this, this growing sense of public empathy for police officers who enact vigilante justice. Um, <clears throat> one of the, um, one of the, the one of the mentions you have is uh, former police detective Arthur Joseph Wamba. He wrote a series of novels painting police officers as only human or good people who've been turned into brutes and alcoholics due to the pressures of the job. We're seeing this play out even in Hollywood today. Um, probably the, one of the most noteworthy pieces that he's pushed out was the Choir Boys. So seeing that, this is the depiction, right? where police officers, they're supposed to be good people who just get turned by the pressures of the job. How does this problematic image become so acceptable among police officers as a role model and to, and, and for the larger community? Yeah, I mean, this is such a big question. I think I just kind of skirt around it in the book a bit. I'm not really a cultural historian, although I, I do reference a few things like Joseph Wambaugh's novels and the, and the film that was made from it. But I think this is something that's going to be familiar to anyone in the audience that's ever watched a TV show, ever watched yeah. a movie. You know, for, for a long time now, at least since the 1970s, and we can kind of see Joseph Wembaugh is credited. He's, again, he's an L.A. police detective, former military Vietnam veteran who was a budding novelist, and he quit the police department and, and wrote all these police kind of procedural detective novels. But he was pioneering in the sense that, I don't know, if you can go back, if anybody has that memory of something like Dragnet in the 1950s, which was, there was a movie in the 80s. If you're at all familiar with it, you know, we get kind of a straight-laced, very serious cop that we, it's kind of borrowing from the image of the FBI. There was a series of FBI movies and TV shows that the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, helped kind of shape the public image of the, of the federal agent. You know, they're very serious, they're professional, um, they're experts, um, they're kind of Boy Scouts, right? They do the right thing. Uh, they, they, they're never on the take. But Joseph Wambaugh started to write about cops in a much darker, grittier uh, way that he was aspiring to something we might recall authenticity. We could argue how authentic his portrayal of police were. But he greatly romanticized the troubled cop, right? The mm -hmm. cop that had these ambitions and these kind of good intentions of going to the police force. But now he's seeing all this violence and drug abuse and, uh, and, and also abuse of his fellow officers. And now he's being kind of dragged into the gutter of the dark, gritty city of you know, New York in the 1970s. And so he's being corrupted by it. He's suffering PTSD. He still wants to do the right thing, but he's so frustrated by kind of the, the liberal turn in American life, the rights revolution of the 60s, all these 
petty criminals, now they have the right to a lawyer. We got some liberal judge that just lets a, a rapist go to go rape more people the next day. And so the cop has to take the law in his own hands. And if you've ever seen Dirty Harry, right, Clint Eastwood, have you seen all these other, you know, fantastical movies of the 1970s, like Death Wish with Charles Bronson, where his family's brutally attacked, the judge lets the people go, so he gets a gun and he takes the law in his own hands. And this happened, of course, in, in real life, too. Think of the, uh, what's his name, um, Bernie Getz in, in New York City in the 1980s, mm -hmm. riding a subway, he gets um, uh, attacked by black teenager muggers, and he took out a gun and shot at him. And he becomes kind of a cause celeb of the kind of conservative vigilante movement. And that, that played out in real life. But in the, in, in the films of the 1970s, 1980s, we're going to see a great deal of the romanticization of the alcoholic, divorced, womanizing uh, cop who is only, married to his job and blah, blah, blah. We, you know, we see this well into the present day. I mean, I've, I've watched a few episodes that I could stomach a Chicago PD. Uh, it's absolutely um, playing into these stereotypes. Uh, even one of my all-time favorite shows, and maybe yours as well, The Wire. HBO's The Wire. I mean, if you're familiar with that show, which portrays policing and crime in a very complex and I think sophisticated fashion, we still see Jimmy McNulty, who very much is the, you know, the, the troubled, romanticized cop. He's not quite a vigilante um, until, but we see scenes in The Wire where they have to take the law in their own hands. Yeah. So this is part of our culture. And yeah. I think, we, you know, and again, I don't know, I don't think I'm really equipped to, uh, because I'm not a culture historian. I don't want to make claims that I can't support with historical evidence. So maybe I'm taking off my professor hat here and just talking to you one-on-one. Uh, yeah. so we, we can imagine the impact that the way we portray police in popular culture has had on aspiring police officers. And we can see that, and not only that, but it, you can imagine the impact that it's had on our accountability mechanisms, right? Because there's a great deal of sympathy or police officers, even those who do harm, because we've created this image of the police officer as a troubled, but ultimately out for the better good of the population that has to deal with uh, the dregs of society in this crime ridden jungle. Uh, and so sure, they, they break the rules sometimes, but aren't they really just trying to make us safe? Uh, now that's not something I believe in. And I think we can to add to that, a, another competing image of the police officer that I think makes accountability even more hard, more difficult to achieve, is what happens to our sense of first responders following 9-11, now 20 years ago almost, 19 years. So now, in addition to the romanticization of the troubled cop, we also have raised the image of police officers to one of kind of a, a, a hero status that is beyond reproach. You know, 100 years ago, 1920, we have all these silent films, uh, the so-called Keystone Cops, you know, where we picture police officers as kind of, they're the dregs of society, right? To become a cop, mm -hmm. you didn't need education. They're part of some corrupt political machine. They only got the job because their uncle's an alderman you know, or, you know, works as mm -hmm. a precinct captain for the local political machine. And cops were, for much of the 20th century, were depicted as buffoons, as low educated, um, ignorant fools. But that image has gone away as well. And so now, to uh, criticize the police in some circles in American life is to be un-American, right? That to even raise the idea that police um, are capable of wrongdoing suggests that you're turning your back on our most sacred heroes that run into danger as we run away. And of course, there's some truth to all of these images of police, absolutely. But the cultural power is so immense that I think it's disrupted our ability to hold police accountable because we're holding these um, complex, evolving, contradictory views of the police officer. Uh, and, 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 but, you know, you might see uh, different depictions of police out there and disagree with me. I mean, it's quite rich and complex. Well, you know, you, now that you mentioned accountability, right, as, well, as, as this book unfolds, you see the torture accusations against John Burge and his men, uh, what they call themselves the Midnight Crew and the A-Team, it continues to grow over time. And and it, could have, and it could have been checked by the supervisors, the officers of the court, the state attorney, the mayor, none of them. All of them affirmed the methods. So are we still in this era of failed accountability? And I just wanted to ask myself, I just kept asking myself, how does it get this bad to where all the mechanisms to, like, to checks and balances say, you know what, this is okay. We're getting the results. We're, 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 we're knocking, we're, you know, we're clearing off the log books. Uh, so are we still in a period of failed accountability? Yes. yes. Next question. 
So, no, yes, and here's, and, and, you know, you're pointing to so many things, and, I'm, and I appreciate that you've, I'm sure a lot of stuff you already knew before you read the book, but I'm glad that you're seeing these points showing up in my book as well, because I think one thing that I try to do with the book is to show the bird scandal demonstrates the intersection of personal bigotry and systemic racism. You know, often when we write about racism in America, we talk about institutional racism, and it's, oh, it's, it's, it's on point. But sometimes when we talk about that, we, we remove racists from the system. We say, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's all a bunch of good intention bureaucrats or colorblind race neutral laws that are now kind of inadvertently triggering uh, racial disparities. Well, but not, no, because throughout the criminal justice system at every level from the patrol officer to the prosecutor, to the judge, to the state legislature who passes the laws, et cetera, we are having bad faith racist actors employing the law in discretionary fashion to damage black people or other persons of color or poor people of any color. And so we have racist actors doing racist things inside a system that was designed to perpetuate white supremacy and to create racial disparities. So it's a, it's a mess. And so we should not be surprised that accountability mechanisms do not work outside of the context of a rigorous social movement activist or social activist movement. Right. And so I think, what we're seeing in the Burge cases um, is that police abuse of any degree, whether it's the usual beating or the unusual sensational torture, this type of police violence cannot happen without being facilitated and incentivized and encouraged by other actors in the criminal justice system and in our vast kind of social system that is a modern American city. So as you mentioned, John Burge would not have been able to get away with coercing confessions. In fact, he might not have even sought out coercing confessions if he wasn't being encouraged and incentivized all along the way by his supervisors, by the patrol officers who bring in the, detect the, the suspects often to the detectives, but particularly by the state's attorney's office, right? These are the prosecutors that need those confessions to win convictions in court, right? And so if you're, and if you're being evaluated as a very young prosecutor by how many guilty pleas you can get, how many convictions you can win in a courtroom, you know, how much are you really going to care about where the police officer got his evidence from? And what better evidence to get a plea deal or conviction in court than uh, an incriminating statement, a confession? It's a slam dunk. And on top of that, which is another point I haven't really mentioned here, it's, but this is something to, that I really is highlighted in the Burge scandal, is Burge and his men, they targeted the most vulnerable and marginalized people for coerced confessions. And the, who are those people? These are people tied to, likely guilty of horrendous crimes. You know, the most famous cases coming out of the Burge scandal is a man named Andrew Wilson who shot and killed two cops in the middle of the day in February 1982. And his guilt is hardly in question. And there, there are some activists that might question whether Wilson was guilty. Um, I'm convinced and I think the evidence is overwhelming that Andrew Wilson shot and killed these two cops. So if you're a prosecutor and you're about to try to get the death penalty for a cop killer, he killed two cops. One of them had several children that now don't have a father. Why, how much are you going to care that this cop killer got threatened, got slapped around, got pushed up a flight of stairs? Now, the electric shock might make you pause, but at the end of the day, not only do you personally might not care, you want to send this guy to the death chamber. But even, even if you do care, you're going to have all the pressure of the elective office of the state's attorney, who, by the way, during this case, the state's attorney was Richard M. Daly, the son of a mayor, future mayor himself. These people want to get convictions. The, the detectives need to get uh, their cases cleared. Otherwise, they're going to lose their job or they're not going to get promoted. So there's so much pressure that all along the line, we're asking a great deal to expect any of these people to blow a whistle when something of this nature happens. Uh, and so this is, that's why I say it's systemic, right? Because all along the line, all the places where there's supposed to be a check on police violence, there's, there's room for racist discretion. There's uh, incentives. There's very few incentives to come forth and, and blow a whistle on something like this, right? All of the criminal justice system is being designed as a machine to just put out, push out clearances, convictions, and then you got a, a, a state attorney or a mayor running for reelection every single you know, every couple of years, you know, being challenged somewhere from some political opponent saying they're not tough enough on crime. So they have to demonstrate their law and order bona fides. And who's the collateral damage of that demonstration? It's a bunch of young black gang members who are guilty of, of shootings, arsons, sexual assaults. And again, most of the birds torture survivors are likely guilty of the crimes in which they mm -hmm. confessed under duress. 
But this is where I always have to pause and obviously say the obvious. It doesn't matter what you did. I don't care if you're a cop killer or you're a rapist. You have civil rights. You have human rights. And what happened with the Burge case is we allowed torture to continue to infest the Chicago Police Department. And Burge and his men ran amok for two to two and a half decades. And in addition to violating the rights of people who committed heinous crimes, they also, if it matters to you, they also convicted innocent men who wound up on death row. Now, I don't think it matters if you're innocent or guilty. You don't deserve to be tortured. It's against the law. We can't allow it to happen. But it's a very difficult thing to hold police accountable when they coerce a confession from someone guilty of a serious crime. So if, we're, if you're interested in justice today and accountability today, which I'm sure everybody here is, and you already know what I'm about to say, but we have to make sure we're rallying around all victims of police violence, not just the choir boy, the boy scout, the innocent, but the, the, the most uh, unsympathetic victim of police violence needs all of our attention and support, or we're all in danger. Okay, so, so um, I'm gonna ask this one question because you already answered two from the crowd. Um, before we start talking about the legacy of, of John Burr's police scandal. So this question um, is, do you believe that, that transparency in police data usage will help reform the police or is there a reformation of unconsciously biased beliefs that's needed? Right, well, I think uh, that's just so much, my mind's gonna go in all these directions. I wanna, you know, if you, I know I've talked to, I've been on a panel with Brandon before, I'm really uncomfortable with the whole idea of reform anyway. I mean, that my book is full of episodes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s where we reformed the police department. The police have been in a state of perpetual reform since at least, I don't know, the first day they created a police department. Every single generation of policing is a reformed generation, yet here we are. And so, um, you know, where does this lead us? And I wish I had the blueprint, but we're talking about abolition of police, we're talking about defunding the police, we're looking at a, a, some sort of radical new creative vision of what public safety could look like that doesn't involve uniform police departments, right? Mm -hmm. So we can, what, what, in the meantime, reform is, ne is necessary because reform is harm mitigation, harm reduction, right? In the meantime, before we get to the revolution, we got to make sure we're safe out there. We can get through, you know, survive another year. And so, yeah, we're going to have to do some reform. And yes, we need absolute transparency in police data. Police mm -hmm. data should be widely available on websites and everywhere we want them. We should have a civilian oversight of police data and statistics, uh, police Unions should be resisted when they, when they attempt to keep police data from the public eye. So police transparency, transparency of data and statistics will, I think, contribute to a lessening of some of the harm that police departments do. And you said, in, but yes, in addition to that, you say, is there a reformation of unconsciously biased beliefs? Yes. I think now you're talking about something about, I don't know, the psychology of the police officers, the internal subculture of a police department needs to be radically transformed. Uh, and also our collective culture, as we talked about uh, the, the, the Joseph Wamball novels and even, you know, Jimmy McNulty and The Wire, like we need to, we need to uh, attack the, uh, and radically change the way we understand policing, the way we talk and speak and think about them, the way we portray them on television and movies. So if you're, you know, I could go on and on. I think what the, the, the way I'd summarize this is, one, we're going to need, I think, a radical transformation of the police model. If not a complete de-escalation of it, dismantle the police and let's start somewhere new. Together, all of us, including former police and police administrators. Help us figure out a better way to do this because the way we've designed modern police departments is failing. At least it's failing uh, some of us, right? It's, it, the police departments, that they're, they're, they're wildly successful in other things, right? Maintaining property, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, maintaining white supremacy, maintaining racial disparities, if that's what it's supposed to do, then hey, it's working great. Um, mm -hmm. So one, we need to be a little more creative and radical in our, in our solutions here, but also we gotta be holistic, right? He says, should we do this or should we do that? Well, obviously if we had a big, if this wall behind me had a hundred levers and each one of them was reform, reform of this, reform that, change this, re revolutionize that, dismantle this, well, we need to go, all of us, different walks of life, professors, activists, students, doctors, nurses, teachers, police officers, we got to pull all the levers because we're going to fix this problem. It's not going to be one thing here, one thing there, one mealy mouth half effort over here, or we're going to have to, we're going to have to get creative. We're going to get dirty. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be hard. Uh, but thankfully there's so much activism and movement on this front right now. You know, I just wrote this one book. It's historical. It's about Chicago, one place, one time, but there was so, there's an entire library full of these books. 
There are podcasts every day. Like we could fill up panels like this every night with different people that are going to have far more clever and experienced things to say than me. So yeah, we got to do it all. So, so as we're getting into this, the legacy and aftermath of birds, right? And you're talking about activism. We have the Chicago torture justice movement. Um, even though that started, it did end. It did not end with the conviction of John Burge and the abolition of the death penalty in 2011. We have the Black People Against Police Torture legislation. We have the Torture Inquiry and the Relief Commission. You even had the appointment of a special master role to locate those with valid claims of a Burge coerced, coerced confession. And there's also the Chicago Torture Justice Memorial Project, a require and the requirement that this topic must be covered in school curriculum. And then you also, we had reparations. Everything I just mentioned, and I'm sure there's some things I left out. Is this enough to, to make right for what happened over this, what, 20 year span of torture by John Burge and his department alone? I mean, in his area alone? Yeah, it's not enough, obviously. I mean, first, yeah, it's the, the torture crisis in the Chicago Police Department is not confined to Burge. And so this is another conversation we could have of the kind of the, the danger that I, uh, that my decisions have of replicating the police narrative, which is this, which is Burge, which is John Burge and he's gone, so the torture's over. Well, mm -hmm. police torture happened before Burge. It happened during Burge, but in other locations. It happened after mm -hmm. Burge. So the police torture crisis in Chicago is much larger than one police officer and his men. Um, and, but okay, but to get to your question of you know all of the accomplishments of the social the Chicago torture justice movement and, all, and other activists that have won incredible victories in this fight for accountability, um, certainly it's not enough. Um, and I think where we would have to begin, which is something that the Chicago torture torture justice memorials project did, is they go to the survivors themselves, not just the the men. It's almost all, most of the torture survivors that we know of were men. Although I've gestured in a few places of where women were abused and and the likelihood that there's a lot of unknown people who were abused that were likely women. Because if you weren't arrested, you probably didn't make a, um, a public outcry. And so Burge and that they, they also coerced statements from, from witnesses who were never charged with a crime, so they never came forward. Many of them were women. Anyway, my point is, most of these people are men, but we also, when we're talking about survivors, we don't just mean those who directly suffered from the acts of police violence. But we're talking about their family members, their romantic partners, their spouses, their, particularly their mothers. The, tor the, tor the torture survivors' mothers are central players in the social movement, which is very common. Think about the mothers of the men who have been killed by police in the recent past. Mm. Mothers are very much front and center. If you're familiar with US history, think about the Scottsboro Boys, the 1930s, the mothers of the Scottsboro Boys were front and center in the movement. So the mothers, the brothers and sisters, the children, the cousins, and essentially, right, the community. Right, black communities that were affected by Burge and his men. Now, Burge is still a boogeyman name that's circulated in black Chicago to this very day. And what we have to do is we got to go to those people and ask them, is it enough? I mean, you're asking me because I'm here, but I would yeah. say, well, I, I would say, no, it's not. The, the, one, it raises other kind of more philosophical questions is, um, is, could, is, is there any repair for what's been done? Right? Is there, there's, is, there's, no, there's nothing that can fully repair the damage wrought by the Chicago Police Department in this torture scandal. So one, that fixing this problem may be an absolutely impossible task, but we gotta begin by going to the survivors, the victims, the survivors, families and the communities and asking them what would justice look like in this case. And they did do that. And so they did get some of the, some of the accommodations in this 2015 reparations ordinance came from uh, talking to activists and talking to survivors about what they wanted. So they got things like uh, free college tuition for torture survivors and their children and their grandchildren. They got the curriculum for the public schools. They're going to erect a public memorial. Um, they got free uh, psychological counseling and vocational training. Uh, they also created a permanent center on the south side. It's called the Chicago Torture Justice Center, where people mm -hmm. can go and get resources if they've been survived, survived police violence. They hold... Um, like psychological treatment events for survivors, not just of Burge, but of any police violence. Um, and of course, though, we also got to look because a lot of the, that's been five years since they passed that reparations ordinance and we still don't have a public memorial. Um, most of the men that received money, because there's also a material part component of this, uh, right? $100,000 checks to 57 survivors of police torture. Um, 
$100,000 might sound like a lot, but it's not solving the material needs of torture survivors and their families, not even close. Um, and so there's, it's, it's another thing, it's hard when you write a book like this and you talk about it, how to evaluate, do I wanna emphasize the accomplishments of the movement? Because they deserve credit and because it's empowering to find out what they did and what they accomplished. Mm -hmm. But we don't wanna do that at the expense of saying like, okay, what else needs to be done? And do we, want to, do we want to give the city of Chicago credit for a $5.5 million reparations package? That sounds like a lot of money, but every one of those torture survivors who got one of them checks for hundred grand had to sign a waiver saying they wouldn't sue the city. And those survivors who sued the city often walked away with a settlement of 5 million or more. And so the city, in other words, cleared the books of 57 potential settlements of millions of dollars each. They cleared all those books for $5.5 million in one fell swoop. Not only that, but uh, former Chicago mayor Rahm Emanuel was able to portray himself as the reparations mayor. Uh, that didn't play out over time. You know, Rahm Emanuel uh, suffered the political fallout of the reality that he was not a good mayor for police accountability. Um, so reparations was important, but it's complicated. Um, it was not enough. Um, I imagine that many of the activists now that are front and center in Chicago are, are, are quite radical. And I say that with affection, and meaning mm -hmm. their solution to this probably involves something around uh, the, the loaded and difficult language of defunding or abolition. Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be enough. So I'm glad that you, you started, you, you, you're at this point, right? Because um, Friday will be three years since John Burr's death. What struck me about this about his passing is that this was around the time that we had the trial of the white Chicago police officer um, who was on trial for the murder of Laquan McDonald and the Department of Justice probe found that the Chicago police regularly, regularly used excessive and deadly force and tolerated racist policing practices. Clearly the culture still remains. So in light of this, we're back at the seminal question you and I discussed in the forum earlier this summer. Is it just time that we, we scrap the entire system and put something else in its place, or can it still be saved? And after that, I'm gonna turn that over to some more, we have some more questions from the audience. All right, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, I, I would like this to be a, a, a question that you asked that was open to a lot more people than just me, and I know you would too. Yeah. My um, instincts, my political worldview, and I've been influenced by people who are far more experienced on this than me, is that I'm leaning towards it's time to dismantle this system and come up with something better. Um, as a historian, I like to point out to people that there's nothing natural or organic about the modern police system that we have. It wasn't given to us by God on the sixth day in Genesis. Uh, when we started civilizations and wherever you want to point to the birth is, you know, I don't care where you started at, police departments didn't just begin on, you know, they didn't just make these things out of, uh, you know, from the beginning, from a, like a civilization kit. Police departments did not exist in modern form until, you know, the middle of the 19th century. Police departments as we see them are man-made. They're the, 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 the result of historical forces that are quite mundane and predictable. Um, we lived as uh, humans in highly complex, high population density urban centers for centuries before we even created modern police departments. And there were other methods of law enforcement, don't get me wrong, some precursors to policing like constables and justices of the peace and things of mm. that nature. Um, but the model that we get in the United States in the 19th century comes out of efforts to of racial and social control. And the, the, the context that created the modern police department is not, a, is not a context that's conducive to justice and peace and law and order in the, in the beautiful way we might be able to use words like law and order, not in the politically uh, reactionary fashion. And so we can envision something better. Okay. So um, question from the audience. In contrast to the racial tension strengthened by the recent shootings, is the fraternal nature of law enforcement. I hear a lot of officers talking about bleeding blue which says that their first duty is to protect one another. How do you feel this affects their ability to investigate scandals among their ranks? And also, does self-reporting work in this case? Police culture is very defensive. It's very fraternal. It's very, uh, when I say defensive, I mean, the police often see that it's, it's them versus the world. And for, rightfully so, police are 
uh, an institution in American life and, and world that is um, highly scrutinized and for good reason. Police officers also live and work in dangerous environments. Their physical safety and their lives are often at risk. They mm -hmm. must formulate some sort of kind of fraternity. Right? Of course, that's a, a you know a masculine term. There are many women cops as well. Um, the blue wall of silence, the blue code uh, is very real. It's pernicious. It's um, strong, uh, and and it's it's almost insurmountable. So um, we cannot rely on police offici officials to monitor themselves. I mean, think of you know. Sorry, I don't know the ancient world that well, but you know, we can't have guardians that have to be guarded. Um, <laughs> who's going to guard the guardians or whatever? Um, uh, yes, uh, we. This is, I think another part that there are another elements that I elucidate a bit in the book that I think this question raises is also the idea of does hiring African-American officers and promoting black uh, officers to get, get, having black police chiefs and mayors and you know we see that uh, in the 1970s and 80s particularly there's a proliferation of black men in uniform and sadly we found that um, while a, there is a tipping point where if you get a police department that gets a certain critical mass of black officers who tend to see police violence re reduced. But there are many episodes of police violence perpetrated by black officers. Uh, there's something about the institution of policing that perpetuates white supremacy and leads to state violence against black people, regardless of the skin color of the person, right? You said, as you wrote here, they're bleeding blue. So you can be of any race, once you put on that uniform, you know, you're blue, to use that term. I have a fly buzzing around me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one over here as well. Uh, so the next question is <coughs> the compliment. Your passion is contagious. What can citizens do today to shine a light on this type of activity and ensure this type of behavior ends? That's tough. First of all, thanks for the compliment. If I'm not mistaken, that, that's, a, that's a student of mine that I've had several times. <laughs> I, I know her. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, what can citizens do to shine a light on this type of activity? I don't know. Educate yourself. Read. Pay attention. Um, don't be afraid to speak out uh, in mixed company about issues of police violence and police accountability. Uh, if any part of you is um, drawn to the idea of, of a radical new model of public safety, if you think that uh, you might be a little unsure, like I am, about what it might look like, but you still think that maybe abolishing the police, defunding the police, might have some merit, at least it's something we could all collectively talk about and try to sketch out. Don't be afraid to say it. We don't, we don't, you know, I think a lot of people are saying, well, I don't want to sound too radical. Well, we need to normalize the idea that policing as a, the model that we have doesn't work and that we can envision something different and something better. So you might be accused of being a radical. Um, so just build up that, <laughs> that thick skin and be prepared to, you know, fight respectably with the friends and family members and try to push this issue in a positive direction. Just, just, you know, I don't know. That's all I can say. So we have a comment and it's more so a question as well. By bringing these events to light, are they shocking enough to wake up some members of society that have become desensitized to the consistent violence towards African Americans and people of color? Also another former student of mine. <clears throat> Uh, Tammy, thank you. Oh, but bringing these events to light, are they shocking? I, I think so. I mean, I think that, um, I think we've seen in this year, first, if we were, if, you, if any of you went out on the streets during these protests, you're not, it's not always this, you're not seeing the usual suspects of people that in 2017 or 2005 or 1990 would have been out protesting police violence. We're seeing a much broader cross section of the community. <clears throat> people that previously may have never thought that they would enter the streets and chant, no justice, no peace. So there's clearly something is awakening in, 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 in the spirit and the hearts of ordinary people. And I think also just far more anecdotally, so apologize for this, but I've seen just even public figures speak to this in a fashion we'd never seen before. I wish I could think of the man's name, but he's a sports journalist, a broadcaster of college football that some of you might've seen last week break out in tears. Um, you know, a, a man that previously had not had any sort of reputation of progressive support for, you know, police accountability. Um, some of these events of the recent past, I think, have opened the eyes of a lot more people. And again, there are, what, I, I venture tens of millions of people participated in police accountability protests this year during a pandemic. Now this is, yeah, I do think that we're seeing uh, 
like a prairie fire of support for accountability spreading. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one more question then I'm gonna uh, leave it up to you to kind of wrap this up with any additional information you want us to know and just take away. So my question, this is my favorite question, um, my messy boots question. I know we spend a lot of time talking about the police, but your book clearly shows that there is, this is bigger than one department, an area, a district that's enacting such brutalities. Um, as I've been reading this, we see that there are a number of systemic cover-ups from prosecutors, term <laughs> judges, and even politicians contributing to the suppression of this evidence. So the judiciary, without a doubt, is complicit. So my question then becomes, are we thinking too small when we're discussing quote unquote ref reform? I mean, and how do we tackle this? And also, and I'm putting you on the spot for this, Dr. Bear. Um, have you considered a follow-up book to explore the larger complexities? Because you're continuously, um, you're dancing around that as well as you're talking about this John Burr scandal. And, and it's hard to ignore. All right. So I laugh because you, you said you put me on the spot. I, if I understand your question, it sounds like, Brandon, you're saying abolishing the police is not enough and we should abolish the courts, abolish. I mean, I don't know if you're saying abolish, but it sounds, I think you're right to point to, if we want to provide a public safety mechanism and process that is makes more of the public safe, if we want to uh, challenge or reform or change or revolutionary deconstruct and dismantle uh, mass incarceration, if we want to end racial disparities in the criminal justice system, it can't end with police that we have to be looking elsewhere. And I, and I think that the activists are doing that. If we look at the, the very robust platform of like the movement for black lives, um, there's a lot about policing, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, the, the demands for change involve virtually every facet of American life, politics, economics, of course, the criminal justice system, the court systems, the way we, you know, think of the movement to stop cash bail, um, think about, uh, the, the the prison abolition movement and the the, the challenges to to the um, to corrections and and so so yes I think again to go back all those levers on the wall if we want to see justice broadly um, the police are not the only institution that are in need of dramatic change I mean and this goes to housing healthcare education transportation uh, on and on yeah. and yeah my, my my question I'm I'm putting you back on the spot. Um, Tammy already mentioned, you need, we need another book. So, oh. <laughs> you consider this follow-up book to explore these larger complexities. Yeah, well, you know, I guess I would say is, um, <laughs> it took me 10 years to write this book. And uh, <laughs> those of you who aren't familiar with um, academia, th this book comes out of a dissertation, right? And so I had a lot of institutional momentum and support that leads to the publication of a book like this as in the early years of um, an academic career as I become an assistant professor at UAB in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, typically, a second book for an academic historian like myself often does take many, many, many yeah. years. Although there are plenty of academics who um, ambitiously work on a, a second book that is not as um, robust academic in nature, that is mm -hmm. more for a general audience. And it, maybe that's, that's a, a blueprint for a, a, um, a certain type of career, and a, particularly one that has more kind of public profile. Um, my second book will likely be more of a uh, repeat in style and format of the first book, meaning it'll be mm -hmm. an academic, heavily footnoted university press book. But um, as you could tell, I have a lot of things that I want to get out and I like to talk about this stuff. And I think yeah. um, I will consider, you know, um, staying in the same vein with the second book, but um, I'm, I'm not quite sure where I'm going with the second book. Thanks okay. <laughs> so, what do you hope for the audience to take home um, with them and moving forward after this conversation? Do you, are, are you, you know, is this, because you raised awareness. And this is the thing about John Burgess, this is still happening now. This is still present time. You know, we're still, Chicago is still dealing with the effects of John Burgess. And if they're going to be doing so for the next, I would say, at least the next couple of decades um, because of how deeply embedded this is. So what is it that you want the audience to take home? Do you want them to be, now that you raised their awareness, to, uh, to be more activists in the community around policing? Um, so to be thinking critically about how can we champion police reform that in a way that's gonna be sustainable? Or, um, or, or how do we, um, or maybe even just identifying bad actors 
within a police abusive police culture and combating that like what is it that you want people to take away from this conversation yeah that's a tough question because as you can tell i'm kind of long-winded and i i made a big list of all the takeaways and legacy <laughs> put that aside we ain't got time for that i guess i would say i guess just two things because the book is in two parts it's about the police in the first half it's about the social movement of course they're deeply intertwined throughout um in terms of policing i want to rec i want you to recognize that there's a great deal of reform that has already been happening for generations and generations. Yet uh, uh, the basic outcome of racial disparities and a lot of injustice continues. There's a continuity of racial injustice. And so again, to repeat it, I, I don't, the one takeaway is that police reform is not going to lead to justice. I don't know what will, but it's going to be something far more radical. And I think it's again, holistic in nature. If we want to see public safety and justice, we're going to have to talk about things like redistribution of wealth and resources. We're going to look at housing, education, jobs, employment, transportation, on and on. Now, that's how we're going to get justice. Um, and then second, if we are stuck with this system for the time being, the police system that we have, I think it's imperative for everyone to know from the history and from the present is that police accountability does not work without social movement activism. Just mm. does not work. The, the, the reason why the shooter of Laquan McDonald is behind bars, the reason why John Burge was removed from the police department, the reason why the, the, the men who killed George Floyd are facing criminal charges is only because of social movements, only because of activists, right? And I, I, and I will include, I'll be expansive about this. I'll include journalists. I'll include civil rights attorneys, maybe some academics and all kinds of people that might not put on their little business card, activist. So I'm, I'm being expansive in my definition of social movement. There's a division of labor in a social movement. But yes. police accountability does not work without pressure from the outside of the police department, period. And so if, if we want to see police held responsible when they do wrong things and they do bad things, uh, we cannot look to their supervisors. We cannot look to the police chief or even the elected officials that run the city, like the city council and the mayor, right? And some mayors and city council members can do a great deal. They can be part of the movement, but more than likely not, right? So we're going to have to, and if they do, if they do act, it's because they got pressure from the outside. Mm. If you care about this issue, pay attention, participate, but be careful because participating in social movements for police accountability puts you at risk. Okay. And um, for those who are interested in doing more in, in this arena, do you have any additional recommended readings outside of your book? Oh, absolutely, man. I could go on all day. There's a lot of great academic history books written about policing in the recent past. Um, but it's a lot of the stuff that I think people probably already been reading this year. I really did enjoy reading Abram Kendi's uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist. That talks about the way we should approach conversations about policy, um, right? If, we're, if we don't change policy, we can't, we're not gonna, we're not gonna bring racial justice by change in the hearts and minds of white people. It's not gonna happen. So we need to make sure that our policies are anti-racist, that our policies diminish racial disparity. So I think that's a good place to go. I think Kianga Yamada Taylor's from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation. Um, Kianga Taylor's book is an excellent place. It's a, it's a good, easy read, uh, passionate, incredible, brilliant. A Haymarket Press book uh, you can find probably used on Amazon because people signed it so many classes across America. Again, mm -hmm. Kianga Taylor. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave out so many books that I could think of, but um, <laughs> I'm trying to think what else, you know, educate yourself on civil rights and black power. I think that the right now, particularly the black power movement um, speaks more to our current problems than the kind of traditional narrative of the civil rights movement. So don't shy away from learning about the Black Power Movement, um, the Black Panther Party, uh, on and on. There's so much. I, I, I wish I could, I'll have to like give you a link to put it on a website. But there's a lot of good, a good recent scholarship on policing. It's, it's burgeoning, it's blowing up. I would say, obviously, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow kind of ignited a conversation or re reinvigorated a conversation in 2010 and then her excellent book has some has some flaws in it and so uh and i say that with great respect she would agree there's other books that responded to that there's a, a, a social scientist named marie gotschalk who wrote a book called caught again it, it answers it, it's it's uh it answers the, the flaws of the new jim crow i think and partly by saying 
that if we want to end mass incarceration, we cannot just free nonviolent criminals. We need to understand as a society that we might need to reconsider the sentences of people who committed violent crimes. And if you're not comfortable with the idea that some people who committed violent crimes 20 years ago might no longer pose a threat, then you're not interested in ending mass incarceration because we could free every nonviolent criminal today and we'd still have the largest prison system in the world. And so I like that about that book. It's getting us to challenge, again, it's making us uncomfortable, right? It's, it's, it's easy to say, let's just let everybody who got busted with marijuana go free. If that's, what, if that's your only solution to ending mass incarceration, then you're not serious about it. Mm. So there's a lot of great scholarship out there. I could give you books all day. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Bear, for taking this time to share your expertise, to share your research with us. This is a phenomenal book. If you all have not gotten this book, Beyond the Usual Beating, please go out and get it now. Buy one, buy two, share with your friends. Christmas is coming up, send as gifts. Bring it up at the dinner table for, uh, for Thanksgiving since they're already putting out Thanksgiving uh, decorations. I saw them myself in Walmart. So um, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, I look forward to any additional research and I'm, I'm sure we're gonna have you back again on somebody's panel. Thank you so much for your time. You all, thank you for your participation. Thank you, Brandon, and thanks everyone else for participating and listening. I appreciate it. All right.